Hello everyone and welcome to a very special webinar, How Coronavirus Accelerated Digital Adoption and What Brands Need to Do to Stay Ahead. This webinar is being held in support of Excerpts from Experts, a title published by Fortune Hill last year to support NHS charities together in the UK. We'll be sharing a bit more on that later in the presentation. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items with you so that you know how to participate in today's session. The presentation itself will last approximately 30 minutes with a 30 minute Q&A. You'll be able to send text questions to today's presenters at any time during the webinar by typing your question into the control panel on your screen. We will address as many as we can during our Q&A session at the end. This session is being recorded and will be shared via our content hub, cim.co.uk forward slash exchange within the next few working days. You can also view all of our previous webinars via exchange. Now, I'm delighted to hand over to Caroline Hudak and Eve Williams, who will be today's presenters. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. We're really excited to be here today. Um, so we're going to talk to you about how coronavirus has accelerated digital adoption and examples of kind of brands who've pivoted and adapted and stayed ahead. One of the things I think that is worth pointing out is we've said sort of accelerated, but I think we're very much unfortunately in the middle of this. And so what these are really initial observations, things that we've seen, um, but obviously things are evolving. Um, so this is very much a snapshot in time. So by way of introduction, um, I'm Caroline Nudak. Um, my background is I started out um, on the agency side as with WPP for 10 years. I then shifted into tech, joined a small startup in San Francisco, and then was the fifth person to join the product marketing team at Facebook. Um, after that, I set up and ran the consumer marketing team for EMEA for Facebook um, for a number of years, and then most recently as the regional marketing director for Airbnb. Eve? Um, I'm delighted to be here with you as well. Um, I'm Eve Williams. I'm currently the CMO at eBay UK, having joined um, back in December. Um, prior to that, I worked at ASOS, the online fashion brand, um, where I was the global brand director for seven years, looking at our acquisition engagement and then brand development as well. Um, prior to that, I worked for um, the Omnicom agency, CEDA, looking at how we use content to engage with audiences like Tesco and British Airways. So, um, as Caroline said, delighted to be here with you today and talking to you about some of the observations from brands that we've seen um, over the last year and how they've innovated. So I'm going to start and just kind of set a bit of a scene and then Eve's going to talk, talk through some examples. So in terms of 2020, as I'm sure everyone who's listening in knows, it was not your typical year. So the world was very much kind of turned upside down um, and that led to a huge shift in terms of um, consumer behaviour, but also really accelerated the shift to digital. And brands in a lot of ways were sort of left to figure out what to do in you know, what is very much an unprecedented time. And it's interesting to see how some really adapted and did really creative, interesting things while others sort of were left behind. So I found this quote from Steve Haskell, who's the president and CEO of Reuters, who said, I think we've seen three to four years of progress in just three to four months in terms of acceptance of what the new world needs to look like. So what he was talking about there was this huge shift to digital. And what I would say is I actually think he's being very conservative and um, all the CMOs and business leaders I've spoken to have said it's much more like 10 years in terms of the shift. We've seen a lot of um, huge shift, as you'll see later in e-commerce, but also these sort of nascent industries that have now very much become mainstream. So looking at um, consumers and kind of how it affected them, I'm sure as everyone here can relate, um, 2020, our lives were not what they usually are. So, you know, there've been huge pressures with families, but I think what's interesting here and what Eve and I were talking about is, you know, there has been a balance and while there've been a lot of hardships, there have been some good things. So families have very much been under pressure, but there have been good things in terms of, you know, a number of families really enjoying spending that time together and kind of work-life balance becoming much more of a topic that I think people are readily discussing, remote working and um, those kind of areas, which before, you know, weren't really sort of mainstream kind of have become the default. Um, in terms of the economy, there's obviously huge anxieties. I think, you know, massive amounts of layoffs, um, obviously a lot of government funding needing to kind of support businesses, but there have been savings in terms of people, again, working from home, um, not going out as much. Um, so, you know, there has been that side as well. I think another thing that we've really seen, which actually is quite relevant to kind of 
what we're doing today and sort of supporting the NHS charity is really people coming out in a sense of community, which I think a lot of people are saying they haven't really seen since, you know, World War II. I think the example we've used is when the NHS um, asked for volunteers and they initially were looking for 250,000 and they got over 750,000. And I think everyone can relate in terms of clapping for Claro's and sort of other programs that are going on that people really are sort of looking at the greater good and a sense of community has sort of come to the fore, which I think has been really nice. So I think along with consumers and sort of their lives turning upside down, sort of by necessity, the plans of business were also thrown up in the air. So, you know, unfortunately, we have seen, you know, a large number of bankruptcies and um, largely in sort of physical retail. So you'd see sort of Arcadia in the States. You've got sort of J. Crew, J. C. Penny. I would say those certain physical retailers, so Next, for instance, has adapted and actually done phenomenally well. So I think it really goes to show that if the business is fundamentally healthy and also has a sort of growth mindset. Um, they do actually end up doing well. Obviously, small businesses under huge pressure. And um, other things that we've seen is while sort of physical retail has done really poorly, there's been this exponential growth in terms of online platforms and sort of payment platforms. So Amazon, for instance, I think I was reading that Jeff Bezos made 12 billion in a single day. Um, you know, if you look through, um, there've been huge um, sort of disparity in terms of winners and losers um, of who's actually done well. So Amazon, obviously like AWS um, and their sort of main platform, PayPal, we've seen huge growth in sort of partial payment platforms like Klarna and Afterpay. Um, and interestingly enough, um, there's been this huge shift from a sort of cashless payment system, sorry, a cash-based um, payment system globally to a cashless payment system. So a country like Germany, which surprisingly is still a very cash-based economy, in 2020 it was the first time that credit card payments actually overtook um, cash payments in Germany, and we're seeing that as a huge trend sort of across the board. Um, I think the other thing that we're seeing is everyone sort of already lives in somewhat of a multi-channel world, but now everyone's kind of got their Zoom and their Slack and their WhatsApp and their Signal and a million different things that they're sort of multitasking um, and using as a way to sort of contact consumers. So in terms of um, the shift from online to, um, to from offline to online, it has been really exponential. The other thing that we've seen is these um, somewhat sort of nascent industries, which you know were either startups or have been around for a bit, but were, really weren't mainstream. Suddenly become very mainstream. So a cardio, for instance, you think everyone shops groceries online, but that actually wasn't the case. But now it's sort of increasingly becoming the case. We're seeing sort of other things like e-learning. So Udemy is a big um, e-learning platform. So things like Masterclass, Skillshare, and um, anyone who's homeschooling right now um, has been using all of these a lot. Um, online fitness is another area. So you've got companies like Peloton, which were sort of early movers, and um, other brands like Fit, um, which is a UK startup, which actually um, has gained huge traction during this. And you're seeing a lot of people who previously were sort of in-person Pilates teachers suddenly completely transforming their business. Um, delivery companies, so um, you know, Uber Eats, Deliveroo, obviously huge traction there. Um, and then eHealth as well, so platforms like um, Babylon Health, again, becoming kind of the de facto way um, to you know, look at sort of different health issues. Um, so it's really interesting in terms of a lot of these industries that probably in 2019, you'd say they're still quite niche, they haven't really become mainstream. 2020 really propelled them to the fore. So I think looking at that sort of context setting, brands really sort of had a choice in terms of how they adapted to the environment. And Eve's going to talk to you a little bit, bit about this, but really it's sort of, you know, how do they behave? How do they adapt and pivot? You know, if they thought things were just going to stay the same and they were just going to go on as usual, that really wasn't going to work. I think kind of ways of working, being really creative, being really fast. Um, but then also how they adapt to the needs of their consumers, how they talk to their consumers in a way that sort of feels um, empathetic um, and understanding sort of that a lot of people are going through a lot of hardships right now and they don't want to be overly consumerist. Um, but also, you know, really how they embrace digital channels um, and do that not just as a fad or something that's a kind of side project, but really that becoming kind of the core of their marketing plan. So I'm going to hand over to Eve, who's going to go through examples of brands who've um, really set the gold standard for this. Thanks, Caroline. Um, so building on the context that Caroline shared, I thought it might be helpful to start by just providing some of the um, kind of themes that we identified and how those brands have really um, showed up during the last year. So um, if we go on to just talk about some of the, those themes that have been present, 
Um, we'll give examples of these in a minute, but I just thought it was helpful to just provide these as kind of to have in your mind as you're um, hearing about some of these examples, just to think about the ways that these, custom these um, customers have demanded our brands to change and adapt um, to their lives over the last year. Um, so the first one in providing support, this has been really about understanding those brands who have taken the option to proactively step up in the efforts to support the work against COVID, those who have been impacted on the front line, those losing their jobs, or those whose lives have been impacted. And this is all about understanding the unique role that the brands can play and the right they have to be in that space at the point. The second one of being responsible is really understanding that brands have an opportunity to really kind of set an expectation on how um, they behave and then how consumers will as well. So they've been able to show that they are stepping up at a time that everybody needs to play a part in being the communities um, that we've also, um, that Caroline has mentioned. So even if this meant stepping away from their core, it's also meant that they've had the ability to think about their brand positioning, the service they provide and the access to customers. Increasing access, I think, is a really exciting one, which is all about the democratisation of experiences, the reality of, le um, of life switching to online. Brands have been able to increase their reach, and I think the examples we've got here today um, give really good um, insight into that. Staying connected has been a massive thing around um, how consumers who haven't been able to interact physically have been able to um, continue those bonds um, over the period. And I think we've seen some amazing um, innovation and step up from platforms that hadn't had anywhere near the penetration really growing in demand and presence on the apps of, our, um, our, of customers today. And then the last one on providing joyful relief, I think is a really important one that we've all needed to bear in mind over the last year to understand when customers are going through difficult times, how do, make, how do brands make sure they tread that fine line between providing light relief um, and joy um, in a very difficult context. So I'll move on to the examples um, to share in a second, but the one thing that I think goes through all of these um, and to bear in mind is the, the presence of um, empathy that exists for all these brands. So life has got more digital, as we talked about, through the arrival of lockdown and through the acceleration of digital adoption. But brands have had to find ways to express their human side and show their empathy. And this empathy is what really helps customers um, to relate to brands, but helps brands understand what they can, the role they can play in the lives of um, their consumers as well. And I think should hopefully also set up a lot of these brands for success in the future as they build this this, um, this empathy ongoing. So moving on to our first example in providing support of Burberry. Now I've included this as the first one and they're probably with the most um, visible brands to show up at the beginning where they really stepped up early on in lockdown um, and made a, a huge commitment of how they'd be supporting community vaccine and hospitals. Um, I raise um, Burberry as the first one because I think they were one of the ones that are most confident in showing that a brand could have a point of view and could talk about this but put investment and put their resources behind it. So they repurposed factories to make surgical masks and gowns, they contributed to funding of the Oxford vaccine and they also donated to charities like Fair Share, which were focused on tackling food poverty. Now, this kind of messaging was also um, present on their home pages and across a lot of their comms just to show that ongoing support. Um, on the next slide, brands like um, Uber and also uh, recognised by Pret as well took the option of showing how they could use their platforms to really support NHS and key workers more explicitly, so promoting the services they are offering to them. So Uber used the hashtag GratefulUK and they gave away 200,000 rides and 80,000 meals um, early on in lockdown. Um, Pret also gave away um, hot drinks and 50% off food to NHS workers. And what's interesting now is that brands like Uber are continuing to understand that the role they can play uniquely by also pivoting to offering free rides to passengers to travel to mass vaccination centres and joining on um, the campaign by the Sun on the Sun Jabs, the Sun's Jabs Army. So I think this just shows how these kind of brands have been able to show the empathy to customers around those people that are working the front line. Um, Gymshark have taken a slightly different approach in recognising how the period has really impacted um, their customers and the people that they need most and that they cater for. So the gymwear startup decided to um, show support closer to home by recognising their customers were going through, who were personal trainers by losing um, their, their jobs um, in the short term. So Gymshark managed to use their platform to give and personal trainers exposure and keep them working. Um, ben Francis, the founder, talks a lot about the importance of being able to pivot in the short term um, and rally around um, 
the purpose of uniting the, um, the conditioning community. So they launched this fund um, for personal trainers and would live stream workouts to their 1.7 million followers. And I think shows that they relate to and can understand that the lives of their consumers has been changed um, overnight. And then the last one in providing support is the BBC, um, who are famed for the education they provide. But the media platform took a um, a bigger role by recognising the unique role they could play in helping uh, the lives of customers who were having to deal with homeschooling with the launch of their lockdown learning where they put content on TV, I, iPlayer um, and online to make sure that viewers were supported over that period with content but also programmes that were relevant. Um, again, this is brands innovating and um, trying to be agile by even in the last few weeks networks like BT and E are offering free access to content without eating into data Aware, aware that not only are customers um, a challenge with lockdown learning, but also with the reality of access to um, internet and devices in their homes for families. Um, so if we then go on to the next one about being responsible, this was all around how a brand um, is showing the awareness of what's going on in their lives and the roles that we've all got to play. So starting with Nike, who are always famed for their bold statements and the purpose of enabling everyone to be an athlete. They really use their platform to encourage people to stay home. Um, they engage talent like Cristiano Ronaldo and team like the LA Lakers to share the message too, all around the theme of play inside and play for the world. And all around showing support that talent training at home rather than on the pitch reminded us to stay home and look after each other at this point. Um, Thai Airlines was a rather unique one where they really um, innovated around how they made sure that they were encouraging people to stay home and that's how they were gaining miles that they would use in the future rather than um, encouraging people to travel and showing that actually those brands who were taking a bold pivot and recognizing that the, the service that they provided to consumers wasn't responsible right now they wish but um, the, one of their comments was that wish to stand by the side of all people in Thailand during this difficult time by urging them to practice social distance at home to stop the infection of the nation and I think that shows a real bold approach that these brands were willing to stand up and be seen um, Sainsbury's identified the unique challenge that a lot of their vulnerable customers had and changed their whole approach to opening hours so shoppers could feel safer. So those um, customers over 70 could get priority access three days a week, nine till 10. I think this all shows that all these brands have had to take a very um, unique and specific approach of what it is that they can do to support customers at the moment. Um, the next one on increasing access, I think, is a really interesting one because it lends itself also to this concept of um, democratisation of experiences. So where consumers have previously um, often there's been a kind of an exclusive sense in how people have been able to get access to experiences by being able to visit places or cities or restaurants where it's cost money that people might not have been able to um, spare. Actually, brands have had to think very carefully about how they can make the experiences they've got far more accessible to consumers um, through the way they set themselves up. Um, so the first example is Chester Zoo, um, who launched content live on their Facebook platform. So during the day, people could see live streams of what was happening around the zoo um, for, for entertainment for their customers and for families, um, which I think just shows innovation from those organisations. It shows that the world must go on and they still want to um, provide the joy that people can get from, from experiences like um, travelling to zoos. Um, Getty, I think, um, probably win one of the awards for the most um, innovative and creative approach to how they engage their consumers over the period. Now, obviously, with people being encouraged to stay home, I think one of the big challenges has been how have um, how have consumers been able to how have brands been able to create ways to do innovative, fun things that consumers would want to be engaged with to um, kind of spark that joy and that creativity. And the Getty um, Art Challenge was launched to encourage people to be creative with three items around their home to recreate a piece of art from their collection. Now, for many people, this kind of art would have felt incredibly inaccessible before and they would have never um, visited the LA Gallery. But actually creating this unique content made people more aware of the gallery and receive significant PR due to the amazing visual nature. And I strongly encourage you to have a browse of some of the creations because they're absolutely incredible, but I think show that balance of doing relevance with your brand but then also um, empathy that actually you can um, you need to, you can have fun during this period as well. Um, a lot of the innovation we've seen over the period has also come from food and this has been I think one of the biggest trends over the period. Um, it's split into two and I'll start off with the example of um, a kind of again a democratization of some of the higher end fine dining restaurants and then I'll go on some of the meal kits. Um, so first with restaurants you'd never normally consider that takeout would be a big innovation. 
but actually the big step change that we saw was that um, restaurants that normally wouldn't consider the experience of offering food at home were able to think about how do they deliver experiences for their customers um, that again creates that joy and that kind of those special moments and occasions at a time we can't experience it normally. So the supper app has taken um, Uber and delivery to another level. So fine dining restaurants claimed that in the first week of trading in this new way, like restaurants like Hain, they were selling only 150 dishes, but they recognized that this was a pivot they wanted to make. Hain then said that in the second week they took they sold 500 dishes, but by Father's Day they were delivering about two and a half thousand dishes a week during platforms like Supper. And at Christmas they had 50,000 pounds of, um, of pre-orders of their boxes, which were retailing at 250 pounds each. So you can see that consumers were trying to find ways to still experience these um, these special moments with these restaurants, but actually apps like Supper were able to um, create the um, an ease through the courier service that didn't need integration into things like um, into the other food delivery apps. Um, so then the other example is restaurant kits um, like Patty and Bun, and again where brands um, and these restaurants were probably less accessible because of where they were located in big cities in the past are now able to reach an audience um, all around the UK. And that's been, again, through innovation of thinking about how do they get their services to consumers and make it um, really easy to use but engaging. So working with couriers like FedEx and DHL has meant that these brands that normally would have only been available through um, takeaways in London are now available to anyone in the UK who wants to experience it. And through the community, we've seen that on social channels and um, the kind of buzz that's created around these restaurant kits and many of these brands <laughs> and these restaurants are now saying this, is, this will be a big part that's here to stay for them. Um, so the next one is staying together and it will come as no surprise that I'm going to talk about apps like House Party and Zoom but at the start of lockdown when we were all used to and comfortable with using platforms like WhatsApp and, um, and Instagram they didn't necessarily offer the flexibility to be able to engage with groups of people that we were obviously lacking at the start of lockdown and house party which you see here was one of the apps that in the first month of lockdown and um, reported 50 million um, new signups was and it was number one in most of the app stores for the period and it gave a new functionality to consumers to um, engage in a fun way that took the benefits of the other messaging apps but it did it in a more social way that recognized what they were missing from the rest of their lives at the moment um, Zoom will come as no surprise, um, but Zoom took some very interesting approaches to encourage adoption over the period. So we'll all be very used to Zoom on a day-to-day -day basis at the moment, whether that's for work or connecting with families. But actually, they um, they were very um, brave and bold in taking steps to do things like changing the way that they um, offered services to consumers. So they reduced or they took off the 40 minute limit to cap people's conversation time, which meant that consumers could use it as a platform to talk to many friends at once without those restrictions of having to sign up, which encouraged adoption um, and encouraged users onto the platform. So, um, and then at the holiday time, they relaunched that campaign with a Zoom together, recognizing it over the holidays, people couldn't be with their families, but they could still identify and could still talk to them um, through using platforms like Zoom, which were now accessible to them from the experiences at the start of lockdown. Um, and last but not least, even just recognizing that some of the kind of innovative platforms like Thoughtful have had to pivot and think about how are people communicating over this period and recognizing that kind of even the language that they're using just shows empathy for how customers um, are experiencing lockdown at the moment. Um, so closing the examples from the brands, um, we'll just talk about the last one on that piece on providing joyful relief. Um, and I think the first one um, is Bumble. And obviously one of the kind of interesting conversations around lockdown and around COVID has been how people have still been able to carry on dating over the period. And I think brands like and dating platforms like Bumble have shown real kind of creativity and innovation to encourage people that um, it's still possible, but to do it in a fun way and in a safe way. So um, real life um, installations like this in parks, recognizing that this is what people's lives are like now um, has provided um, kind of light relief but also a recognition that um, the dating world will continue and Bumble is there for them at this time. Um, TikTok obviously um, I, 
had had its day or kind of was already having a big moment for lockdown but I think over Covid has really um, accelerated in its growth and at the moment about one in three million Brits have the app installed on their phones about 24 million users I think what TikTok has been able to do is combine not just connection but also creativity and as we're talking about here that joyful relief and um, so providing things like the challenges and um, to give people um, reasons to engage and ways to be creative at home beyond just the imagery that they're sharing um, and then the last example I thought it would be good to end on was just um, was Apple and Apple created um, a brilliant ad towards the start of lockdown which was all about working from home and I thought that this um, kind of exemplified a lot of the themes that we've been talking about where they used an ad that showed absolute empathy for what their customers were going through trying to go about their daily lives working from home but do it in a way that with humor that um, recognizes all the conversations that we'll have about people being on mute and kids being in zoom calls and families being around and all the challenges but within that kind of storytelling and that humor being able to weave in the role that apple products can play and um, to make the experience of working from home easier um, so hopefully those have shared some kind of examples of some of these big themes that we think help these brands to stay apart during 2020, that essence of providing support and showing up for those customers that are impacted, whether that's through job losses or through the experiences of things like homeschooling, and um, being responsible, showing that we're all in this together and that we all have to play a part in the change that's going to come, um, the increasing access, so what that meant for democratisation, so brands pivoting and understanding that actually there's an opportunity um, for us to speak to a bigger audience by doing something different, staying connected to the rise of the apps that offer new types of functionality and access to consumers. And then that last one on providing joyful relief as well, which um, is much in need at the moment. Um, so I talked about empathy earlier, but every business has got the choice of how they continue to behave in the same way that all of our customers have the choice of the brands that they choose. And I hope that the examples that we shared um, just give a sense of the kind of creativity that people have brought together. Um, I talked about empathy, but I think I'll just close on that the empathy needs to be combined by a couple of other things. So um, there's the level of empathy which exists, but what really shone out when we were looking at these um, examples is the creativity that brands have um, executed and really pivoting it kind of in very um, difficult times and circumstances to work, but to think about the different role they can play. And then that point on relevance. So what is the unique thing that they as a brand can do that other brands can't do? And I think that combination of empathy, creativity and relevance is really the things that's helped a lot of these brands stay ahead for customers. Um, so I think that brings us to the close um, of what Caroline and I want to share. Before we go into the Q&A, we're just going to pass over to um, Joel from the Fortune Hill team, um, who's behind the excerpts from Experts book um, that the event is um, in aid of today. So handing over to Joel. Thank you, Eve and Caroline. Uh, that was characteristically awesome and uh, no doubt everybody on the webinar will have taken away something beneficial from what you've just shared thank you so much for volunteering your time and thank you to the amazing team at the cim um, you guys are absolute rock stars we are so grateful to you for the support you've given to the marketing community's mission to raise money for nhs charities together's covid19 appeal this is a hugely important and unfortunately topical cause. If uh, it wasn't for the fact that my wife is a doctor, I'd probably only be vaguely aware of what's happening in our health service at the moment. Um, like most people, I would have been insulated from the sheer horror endured by the healthcare professionals during the past 12 months. Our health service relies on people to function, People who have dedicated their professional lives to caring for the rest of us, our families, our friends and our communities. And what they're experiencing on a daily basis has been utterly horrendous. And the scars will remain with them long after the global health crisis has been consigned to history for the rest of us. Most of them haven't even been able to process their experience yet. Um, they've had to compartmentalize their personal trauma in order to keep showing up for work every day to combat this disease and save people's lives. 
I don't want to labor the point because I know that everyone is having their own unique experience in this pandemic. And there isn't necessarily a direct correlation between your circumstances and the suffering that you experience personally. But suffice to say, if you're a doctor, nurse, paramedic, cleaner, porter, or any other human being who's on the front line fighting COVID-19, your suffering has been acute. And trust me, none of these people are doing it for money, nor the personal glory. They work in conditions that are unimaginable to the rest of us. And every day, they're experiencing significant human suffering and loss of human life to an extent that was previously inconceivable. NHS Charities Together provides vital support for patients, volunteers and the staff who are on the front line fighting COVID-19. It pays for them to receive counselling. It pays for communication devices for healthcare workers who are living away from their primary residence in order to protect their families from COVID-19. It pays for things like wobble rooms to be built. And wobble rooms are rooms in hospitals where staff can go when they need to cry and let out their frustration. And it supports so much more. Back in the spring of 2020, the marketing community united to produce this brilliant book, which was our way of um, expressing our gratitude for the efforts um, uh, of the heroes on our front line. So the leading figures in the marketing profession, you know, the, the people that populate the top 100 lists and win can lions and stuff, came together to answer questions about their careers, to give insight and advice, to share their views on great marketing and some silly stories thrown in for good measure. All of this in aid of this amazing organisation and the work they're doing for our National Health Service. Every penny from book sales via wordery.com is donated to NHS Charities Together COVID-19 Appeal. So please, please, please take a minute, go to wordery.com and buy at least one copy. While you're getting your own copy, please also think about who else you know who might like to receive a copy or two. If you manage a team, then I'm sure every single member of your team will want one. They'll benefit from it. And by doing so, you're donating 19.99 to support those who are on the front line fighting COVID-19. Thank you all so much for your support. It's been amazing. So far, the initiative has raised nearly £80,000 and we are absolutely fiercely determined to achieve, at least achieve the £100,000 target that we set when we set out on this mission. And hopefully we can smash it out of the water. I'll hand you back now to Eve and Caroline, who will happily take your questions. Thank you, John. Lovely. Thank you so much to Caroline and Eve for that presentation and to Joel for sharing information on that important cause. Everyone watching live today will have received information regarding purchasing your copy of excerpts from experts. And I'm now delighted to uh, introduce our Q&A session. There is still time to submit questions via the attendee control panel. So please do send those in and we will try to answer as many as possible. So Caroline and Eve on our first question. Um, thank you so much for sharing so many great examples of brands that you've been particularly impressed by how they've responded um, throughout the pandemic. Do you have any specific advice for B2B brands on pivoting strategy based on the new buyer behaviours? And have there been any brand examples in that space that you've been particularly impressed by? <laughs> great question. Um, I'm, I'm happy to start. I'm not... Um, I won't claim to be as expert in the B2B space, but I do recognise that um, for every single business, whether they are B2B or B2C, the person at the other end is just their customer and their customer is still experiencing something different and is having to deal with change of circumstances um, in how they operate, but also pressures from um, different verticals as well and different um, parts of their business model. So I think a lot of the things that we show today hopefully are also things that can be applied within a b2b space as well to recognize that actually the organizations that you're dealing with may also have pressures that have come about through um, financial concerns and the business models are pivoting and how can your services adapt and how can your services evolve to make sure that you are catering for the needs of your consumers who in that case are businesses but still um, will have been challenged in different ways by uh, the pandemic as well 
Yeah, I, I think to add to that, you know, some examples of brands that I think, you know, have done this well, for instance, Visa, sort of a B2B to C brand, they've done a big campaign, which very much been supporting local businesses. And when I go on their website, they're actually, I live in East London, they're showing me local businesses that I know and sort of highlighting them and supporting them. So I think it's back to that thing of sort of providing support and being responsible. And um, so I think I think that's one example. Other brands um, around productivity have obviously done very well. So Salesforce, for instance, is kind of, you know, in a way in a great place, but, you know, has really pivoted and sort of how do they enable working from home and sort of the new sort of world set up in terms of like how people are working. Um, and they've sort of very aggressively gone after that and are sort of advertising really about, you know, how to help you with your new setup and make what you do sort of easier and more efficient. So I think those two good examples. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And some of those brand examples, most of them, in fact, um, rely on fantastic creativity and innovation which is something that I think some of us have felt have been hampered by remote working um, and being physically separated from the teams that normally come together to create great campaigns such as those. How have you um, to both seen marketers and agencies managing the actual process of creativity during lockdown? How have people overcome some of those challenges? Is there anything you've been particularly impressed by? Um, I'm happy to start on this one again, then I'll hand the next one to Caroline. Um, I think I have been absolutely overwhelmed by how teams have managed to adapt and evolve um, over the period. And I think when um, I was at ASOS at the start of the first lockdown, there was definitely a, a kind of feeling of, well, we're going to change, we're going to go to this um, new way of working, but actually it's going to mean that um, it will be back in the office in a few months and actually I think there's now a real recognition that people have had to take a very different approach and kind of mentality to how we work. I think there's often there's a kind of sense that the creativity and um, like how are we going to still manage to gain the right levels of kind of creativity and collaboration to get brilliant output. I think you often have to look at the, the positives of what come from situations actually where people aren't in offices as well and people can gain inspiration through their day and take time out to kind of refresh in a way that they wouldn't necessarily be able to do in offices. So I've seen a lot of organisations really encouraging time away from um, laptops. I think um, organisations like Mediacom are doing things like Mediacom Unplugged, where they have a day away from computers um, each week, which are just really encouraging people to make sure that they've still got the time to um, think creatively, to spend time um, kind of challenging themselves on ideas away from just meetings, which is what can the um can easily become your time and focus when you're at home and thinking that you still need to be connecting with people so i think a lot of businesses organizations have also thought about the ways that they can um, provide inspiration to people um through um talks through um sessions inviting people into some still things like zoom and teams but providing different perspectives um, to the teams who are sat at home as well. So um, I think it's it's encouraged in individuals and teams to be much more creative as well about how they use their time. Um, but hopefully the degree of flexibility that is offered as well has meant that um, creativity doesn't need to happen nine to five. It can happen at the times that it's important for the people that are actually responsible for it. Yeah, and I, I think to add to that, you know, there's often also throughout lockdown, there's been a lot of innovation in terms of different ways that people can connect. So you've obviously got Zoom, but there are sort of various, you know, webcams and things where you can essentially be in like virtual conference rooms. I think the thing that, you know, I found and people I speak to is they really miss just sort of being in a room with people and sort of brainstorming. And there are actually, I think it's called Logitech and a few others, um, these, um, these new sort of technologies that essentially replicate that. So I think as much as people can sort of try and, you know, not just be doing Zoom calls every day, but sort of, figure out different ways to interact. You know, there are other scenarios like um, Facebook portal is really impressive if you guys have used it. And I know a number of people who kind of have that on throughout them working and then they just sort of chat to each other as it goes. So it feels less like a kind of set meeting and more like you're sort of sitting next to them at your desk and you're sort of just, you know, having a bit of banter and catching up, which I think is sort of a lot of what people miss these days. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, another kind of couple of questions we've had are around um, marketers from organisations that were go ahead in terms of sharing resources early on and have now seen that their competitors are catching up. Um, obviously, brands are, are realising that it is so important to be really keeping in touch with customers um, and sharing useful resources and help. How would you say that businesses can differentiate themselves in terms of 
keeping up those communications with customers now that it seems to be quite a general approach that brands are taking across the board? Caroline, do you want to start with this one? Yeah, sorry. Do you mind just repeating it so that I can just in terms yes, of like... Of so um, what would you say that businesses can do to kind of differentiate their communications in terms of resource sharing and helping customers now that so many brands are taking that approach? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I think I think a lot of it is sort of, you know, whether you're in lockdown or not, it's really about sort of how do you continue to sort of be relevant and be useful. Um, so I think a lot of it is you know, communicating with people, um, but doing it in a way where you're continuing to innovate, you're understanding where they are, and you're not just giving them the sort of same thing continuously. Um, I think it is quite a tricky one, because I think what's happening right now is a lot of people are fighting for people's attention, and I think everyone's sort of a little bit burnt out. Um, and so, you know, there are certain things like um, Calm, for instance, is a meditation app, which I think is really interesting. And what they've done is they're doing this sort of daily meditation where you can go in and sort of have like a daily calm and people are using that sort of on repeat. So I think what they found initially were people were logging in and then, you know, they'd use it for a bit and they'd just log out and they wouldn't use it anymore. But then they start this daily calm. So they're essentially creating a habit um, throughout the day. So, so every day someone is using it. So I think that's quite clever in terms of actually how do you get people sort of used to coming back to you by actually creating like a daily habit. I think if you look at sort of what Peloton is doing as well, and um, you know, there's a lot of push notives, they're trying to get you to sort of get a habit where you get your buddies who also have Pelotons and you actually ride with them. So, you know, I've got friends who have like an, you know, 8 a.m. Peloton ride and so they're doing that on a repeated basis. So I think how do you actually become part of um, your consumer's life and part of their schedule is a way to sort of really make sure you're sort of embedded and providing value. Yeah, I think um, to add to it, just on a slightly different um, kind of perspective from the question as well, that at the start of COVID, I think we saw a lot of brands stepping up and providing statements on what they were doing and the role they were playing. The likes of, um, I think, M&S and Bowdoin from a retail point of view did it really well to show, again, to kind of express that empathy and the kind of things that they were they were doing over that period. But actually like we are still in this crisis but this crisis is not going to end when the vaccines have rolled out and there's um our economy is going to need to be repaired and supported for years to come i think we're going to move and pivot to a point now where brands are going to have to think about the role they're playing in supporting the future of britain and the future of the economy the future of our young people who have had who have suffered without um without um, schooling for the period and then also impacts on things like food poverty and I think people like Marcus Rashford stepping up and um, encouraging brands to to play a part and again this is one area that Burberry have got involved and supported him by showing that actually there's an awareness that the UK is going to move from a point where we are um, in the crisis to, to be needing to focus on recovery and I think the the role that brands will need to play in like what what can they do uniquely to help Britain recover if it's consumers or businesses is going to be important and um, eBay places a lot of focus on supporting small businesses and making sure that those small businesses have a future and those organizations can still get the customers even when their shops are closed so how does how do organizations pivot from recognizing that at the beginning it was about things like um, transforming their supply chains to provide PPE to actually now it's transforming their supply base to thinking about how are they empowering um, new businesses and entrepreneurs um, who are trying to set up in very difficult times. So I think it's going to be about consumers are going to be looking at what are organisations doing to play their part um, over the coming months and years to come. Brilliant. And do you think that's a trend, Eve, that's set to continue, potentially, you know, the birth of new challenger brands potentially more socially aware that are better suited to this new normal in which many of us are now operating? Yeah, I think there's um like there's been lots of conversation about responsible brands and brands with purpose for a long time. But I think last year not only did we have the COVID crisis we had to understand and relate to, but um the tragic death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement also challenged organizations to say that we all have all got responsibility in the kind of the community that we build and the world that we live in. And I think 
um, consumers are looking more for brands to take to be more accountable as well. So what I think was particularly interesting last year is that consumers were very um, comfortable with scrutinizing brands and saying, but what are you actually doing and how are you making a step change? And I think that was particularly true in the um, around the Black Lives Matter movement and the statements that brands were making. It was really focused on, well, what are you doing within the organization? What are you doing um, in how you promote yourselves and how you support those businesses as well? So um, I think we're I think we're only going to see it more because I think consumers have got more choice than ever before in the brands that they shop with because they've got access through online resources of um, who they who they choose to go to. Um, but also it's the old age thing that I always believe in that a purpose comes from serving a customer in a specific way and a need that they want, but it's going to be the purpose that's going to differentiate you and your growth long term. So um, I think we are going to see it, but it's going to come from the right place and hopefully it's going to uh, mean that the organisations are doing things that will fundamentally improve the um, the infrastructure of businesses um, and um, industries as well. I think to add to that, you know, what you do tend to see, you know, I don't know if we're technically in a recession yet, but it looks like it's sort of going that way, is um, there's often huge amounts of innovation during recessions. So, for instance, Airbnb was actually set up, I think it was 2008, sort of amidst the financial collapse. What you tend to see during that is there are sort of new consumer needs. Um, you know, when people start up, they tend to be a lot more... Um, spendthrift you know they don't have a ton of money and um, so they tend to be a lot more focused in terms of their mission who they're hiring i do think also you know in terms of the shift we saw earlier there's a shift around fitness and um, there's been a huge amount of innovation there um around e-learning around um healthcare as well and i think you know there are some sort of more traditional companies which have done that successfully i mentioned next i think what they've done is super impressive but there's also going to be a new wave of sort of challenger brands who are sort of digitally native who either see opportunities or you know are better set up to deliver on what customers want so i think we're going to see a new wave which is going to be really interesting Brilliant, potentially lots to look forward to there then. Fantastic. Um, so it goes without saying really that digital is at the heart of this, at the heart of customer engagement, both now and in the future. But what advice would you give to those in industries where customers have been resistant to digital adoption? Um, I, I mean, what I would assume is that at this point, their resistance has been worn down. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, you know, we're, we're seeing, I mentioned earlier, looking at kind of cash in Germany, it's sort of a very heavily cash based society, Germans don't like taking, holding credit, it's a sort of cultural Calvinistic um, approach, um, but they have finally shifted to credit cards and that has taken it, taken over. Um, you know, I, th I think I look at a lot of, um, you know, there have been generational shifts, so for instance, one example of a um, of a sector that historically has been very offline is gardening. Um, so everyone goes to their local garden centre, their mum and pop shops, they like to see the plants in person. But over lockdown, there was a huge surge in terms of interest around gardening and everyone looking online as well. And now there's a massive growth in terms of like online gardening. Um, so I think, you know, there has just been this step change. I look at sort of my parents and their generation you know, they now are happily Zooming with people and doing Pilates online and the rest of it. And I think, you know, it's been a bit of a forced shift. Um, so, you know, there may be certain areas which are resistant, but I think to some extent, people just have to adapt to the circumstances they're in. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think um, that like at the start of the pandemic as well there was obviously challenges around um especially in supply chains how people were going to cope with um like things like online orders and the volumes that be going through warehouses but i think it's now become the norm and there's been a recognition about the kind of step change this is making but it can mean that people are still using small businesses and there's often a perception that if you're using online you're using the big brands with big organizations but to caroline's point you can still be supporting your local community and you can still be supporting the smaller businesses and local community by um by working by by choosing um, to shop online i think also we've seen interesting innovation even from the likes of the royal mail over the period for things like collections from homes so some of the things that we had felt were um analog or hadn't um were kind of fulfilling a need at the moment in one way have then been transformed to actually provide customers with new services that are fueled by people being able to kind of book those services online as well 
Fabulous. OK, thank you very much. Um, and you mentioned just a few minutes ago kind of new businesses emerging as a result of new consumer trends and innovations. Collaborations, too, seem to have been a key way for brands to share resources, potentially when they're operating with fewer staff um, and really extending their influence with new audiences. Is this a trend that you think is set to continue? Um, yeah, I think um, I think digital for a long time now has been able to um, bring brands together in a way that they wouldn't have been able to live and occupy as, um, as well offline. And I think um, like even the combination of the example I gave earlier of um, BBC Bite Size and um, EE giving um, free data access for lockdown learning just shows that actually brands are recognising that the kind of combined power of them working together um, can be very impactful. So I think partnerships in the brand space is, uh, we, I'm trying to think of some more examples of it over the period, but they've been able to um, show relevance because, or they've been able to work because they've been answering a need by them working together and collaborating. I think that collaboration has been um, improved though by the agility that a lot of brands have been able to show over the period. So things that maybe um, a couple of years ago would have taken longer to plan and then execute for all sorts of activity. Brands have had to challenge themselves in how they work and the processes that they would normally go through. And they've actually managed to pivot um, and change business models and agility and to the, to the quote from Caroline shared from Reuters earlier, have been able to accelerate change at a pace that they would never have envisaged. So I think those collaborations have been amazing, but they've also been fueled by the fact that people have been able to work more quickly and in a more agile manner. Fantastic. OK, thank you very much. And um, Caroline, you mentioned consumers being dragged into the digital age, whether they like it or not. Um, but it's not just consumers, is it? You know, there are brands sticking to a bricks and mortar approach, Primark being probably the most notable example of them very vocal about their, um, their desire to stay on the high street exclusively. Do you think mm. brands such as this will struggle if they refuse to embrace digital adoption as we move forward? Um, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting one to sort of actively resist it, um, personally. You know, I, I think with these things, um, things are sort of going in a certain way and they've obviously sort of accelerated and you know it seems unlikely they're going to move back i think you know i, I i'm not a believer that everything is going to shift virtual and everything is going to be digital i think you know with regards to remote learning and remote working you know from when i speak to people everyone says there are huge advantages there's a the flexibility but they really want to be back in office for like a few days a week i think the same is going to be true for um the high street as well you know i think Online shopping sort of is very convenient, but it's not the same as being able to sort of be there, you know, browse through, um, you know, what, whatever's new and actually try stuff on in, in a physical location. So I think there's definitely a role for physical retail, um, but I think it ends up being a hybrid model where you sort of look at your consumer, you look at what they want and you adapt to that. Primark obviously is hitting a sort of younger audience, so it does seem sort of surprising that it's not going to shift um, and sort of invest a little bit more in digital. Yeah, I think um, I agree, and I think uh, coming out of this is going to be um, ever more emphasis on consumers saying that how um, that the community is going to impact where they shop. And I've seen a lot of research from this with people saying it really motivates their choice of um, where they spend because they know the impact it can have on the community and the small businesses. So, to Caroline's point, I think there's going to be um, the kind of in parallel the ease and the adoption of online services, but then the recognition that actually people actively want to make sure that they are helping their businesses that make up the community and the richness of their community stay afloat because it's also a lot of those those businesses during this period that have kind of kept the communities going whether that has been helping to organize um, food drops of people or create new services so I think there'll also be hopefully an increased sense of loyalty and support for those small businesses to keep them going at the same time I think this has hopefully just provided the opportunity for some of those businesses to experiment and scale in a way that they wouldn't have necessarily had the impetus to beforehand, um, which can only help to um, build their growth for the future as well and um, give them choices about how they operate. I think another interesting example in the retail space, so I read recently that Boohoo, which is a sort of you know, online fast fashion retailer, has actually purchased Debenhams. Um, so, you know, that's an interesting example of sort of what was a sort of online challenger brand buying a sort of old storied name. Um, so, you know, 
my advice to Primark would be to, you know, adapt to where the customers are, otherwise they might find themselves in the same place as Debenhams. Brilliant. Well, if any marketers from Primark are listening, then I'm sure they will uh, will take that. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> um, no, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, and do you think we are likely to see this rate of digital adoption that we've discussed throughout this webinar being so fast paced? Is it likely to slow when coronavirus recovery does eventually become widespread? Or do you think this is a trend that is going to continue at pace for years to come? Will brands, for example, backtrack on digital transformations that they might have invested in and adapt to more of a hybrid model that you mentioned, Caroline? Yeah, so I, I was looking at some data about this. So um, they were talking about sort of the growth of e-commerce. I think it grew something like globally, like 34% or something last year, which obviously is insane. Um, and they were projecting that it was going to grow 14 to 15% this year. I mean, in reality, I think no one knows because we don't know sort of where we're going to be. I think everyone probably had hoped we would be in a different situation to what we are now. Um, so, you know, my sense is as long as, you know, the pandemic is lasting and we're in lockdown, you know, it is going to grow exponentially. Um, I think after that, there is going to be a sort of high level of growth, but it probably isn't going to be quite as spiky. Um, you know, I, I do think there are certain things where people will go back. So I do believe sort of physical retail will rebound. Um, but I don't I think there's going to be a hybrid model. Um, so, you know, and, and I really don't think it makes sense for companies to be investing all this time and sort of, you know, changing their digital infrastructure and building out their communities and then sort of go back to what they were doing before. I think this has really been a sort of mindset shift. Um, which, you know, I believe it's going to be a point in time and it will continue. So I don't think the rate and the acceleration is going to be quite as pronounced, um, but I think this is here to stay. I think, um, as Caroline said, I, I don't think the current rate of um, acceleration could even um, could maintain at this level, but I think what we may see is customers, um, sorry, brands being um, excited or um, aware of the the, the agility that they've had and what they've been able to execute and the speed of transformation and what it's delivered for them as organizations and I think we could look forward to seeing some really interesting innovation in the years to come both from a purpose point of view and the kind of things that we they stand for as we talked about earlier but then also in the space of um, like how they show up to customers and the kind of way that those industries are going to need to evolve to make sure that they stay um, relevant to consumers um, in some of the conversations that Caroline have had, we've talked about things like the travel industry and how actually that could completely transform from what we used to think of as um, customers being kind of going on holiday for a period of time and then coming back again. And while that might not feel like a digital innovation or automatically digital acceleration, it's showing organisations and businesses responding because of a change in how customers operate in a digital way. So if people are working from home more and working remotely, that mean that that might mean that people are looking to be able to go abroad and have spaces that they can go and live in for periods of time and work and still do their job, but kind of have experiences while they're there as well, which is going to mean that we're going to need to, um, companies will set themselves up differently because, comp because um, individuals have a different desire to because the world has become more connected all of a sudden. I think another um, another example of that sector-wise is kind of, you know, I think everyone's desperate to like go out to a restaurant and go on holidays <laughs> along with a lot of other things. Um, but, you know, sort of um, the hospitality sector also is shifting a lot and, you know, they're desperate to reopen, but I think what they're recognizing is things like, um, you know, instead of getting your waiter over at the end, actually just having a QR code where you can pay quickly, not only feels like it's kind of safer and more secure in the current environment, but also leads to a sort of significant increase in terms of table takeover and take home rate for the restaurant. So I think I saw some data where it increased take home by like 15, 20%, which is huge. So in that scenario, it not only kind of makes sense for the customer, but also makes sense for the business. So I think we're going to see lots of sort of, you know, digital um so innovations led into those more traditional sort of physical um, industries. Wonderful. Well, I think that is the perfect place uh, to conclude today's webinar, as unfortunately that is all that we have time for today. I'd like to say a big thank you again to Eve and Caroline for those fascinating insights. And um, once you leave this webinar, you'll be asked to fill out a survey on the presentation and we'd appreciate any and all feedback that you can provide to us. As a reminder to the CIM members listening today, this webinar is CPD eligible. 
By submitting CPD, you not only keep your learning and development up to date, but you can also start your journey towards our prestigious Chartered Marketer status. You can find more details of this on MyCIM. On behalf of CIM, a big thank you to Caroline and Eve for that presentation and to Joel for the reminder of why we're putting on today's webinar and a big thank you to everyone for attending today. Thank you for having us. Thank you.